Now, during the Ordovician period, um, the first fish began to appear, and you also had the uh, kind of formation, evolution of many coral reefs. Now, the Ordovician is Ordovician period is best known for its diverse marine invertebrates. Um, these invertebrates include, include uh, graptolites, uh, trilobites, brachiopods, and um, the condons, which are, again, those early vertebrates. Now, your typical marine community during this period consisted of these invertebrates, um, but there was also red and green algae, uh, you have primitive fish species, cephalopods, corals, uh, crinoids, and gastropods. Um, with the primitive fish, um, the kind of group that we're going to talk about in a moment in particular were um, ostracoderms, which were these jawless armored fish. Um, and they comprise some of the oldest vertebrate fossils. Um, during this time, there were also um, uh, remnants of tetrahedral spores, um, which came from uh, primitive land plants that actually started colonizing um, terrestrial areas during this time. Um, so there was a lot going on, both um, in aquatic ecosystems and on uh, land or in terrestrial ecosystems as well during this period. So as I had mentioned before, the primitive fish species that I want to talk about specifically are these ostracoderms. Um, they are armored jawless fish. Um, more specifically, or the more specific name are aranapsids. Um, these um, armored fish, they had um, two different shields per se. They had a, a ventral, uh, sorry, a, a dorsal shield um, that was separated from the ventral shield. So the dorsal field was more of covering the head region, while the ventral shield was more uh, kind of the um, armor comprising the, the tail region. So you had head armor and tail armor per se. Um, and those armored regions were um, kind of covered in these uh, rod shaped uh, or plate like scales that were kind of arranged in um, almost like a, a chevron arrangement. Um, and again, that uh, dorsal shield was separate from, from the ventral. Uh, shield. They had eyes, so they had frontly placed eyes um, that were surrounded by a sclerotic ring. Um, and they were kind of housed in right at the, the, the front or the anterior region um, of the head, uh, kind of in this little notch at the, the anterior end of the, the dorsal shield. Um, the nostrils, they did have nostrils. Um, it's believed that they were placed um, superior of the eyes. Um, so kind of right on the top of, um, either right on the top of the dorsal shield or right in between the eyes. Um, but they had two um, nostrils um, and uh, kind of a, a clustering of um, nerve endings and sensory organs um, at that region. They also had um, the clustering of sensory organs in the cephalic region um, in general. So they had the sensory organs for the eyes um, and the nerves associated with that. They had a primitive brain. Um, they also had this thing called a, a top eye, which you can kind of see is almost like a little diamond shaped right at the top of the, the dorsal shield. Um, the primitive spinal cord, notochord, um, and intestines. Um, kind of uh, separating um, or held in between the, the dorsal and the ventral shield were um, 
uh, numerous gill openings. Um, and again, they they were held between those those uh, the platelets that separated the the two shields. Um, they weren't very long. They were only about fifteen centimeters or six inches long. Um, and again, they had they were they were jawless, but they had a mouth. It was just a small slit. Um, and then most of the sensory organs um, or sensory lines were housed um, towards the 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 front of that um, dorsal shield. Um, they're so they had interesting bones. Um, the dermal bones of these enrapsids, um, they were acellular bones. They consisted of um, aspidine. Um, and it was uh, more of these kind of hollow like uh, dermal bones um, that formed almost a, like tubercle shaped structures. Um, and the sensory organs were housed in those uh, the grooves between those um, tubercles. So these were the early jawless fish. Um, this was uh, where you started seeing kind of the armored plating on the, the early fish species though. Um, as I said before, um, or mentioned before, there were uh, terrestrial plants. So probably the, the most uh, groundbreaking occurrence of the Ordovician was this colonization and development of land plants. Um, these plants resembled small primitive plants like your liverwort species and other bryophytes. Uh, bryophytes are your mosses um, and liverworts, lichens. Um, they lived in moist areas and um, kind of what makes them or characterizes them as bryophytes is that they reproduce through spores, not seeds. Um, and as these plants kind of colonized onto the, the ter terrestrial environments and onto land, um, they added more oxygen to the air. So this was the continuation of um, kind of adding extra oxygen to the air and taking out um, carbon dioxide. And that came at a, a price per se, um, because the end of the Ordovician was, was characterized by a mass extinction event. Um, and part of that extinction event had to do with a massive cooling or rapid cooling period um, that was in in part, very, very small in part, due to the uh, kind of, again, the pulling of, of CO2 from the atmosphere, but it's actually more geologically related than, than atmospheric. But anyway, the mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician, um, that's one of the five largest extinctions in Earth history. Um, technically, it's, we say one in five, currently we're in the sixth, um, mass extinction, the, um, but that's hasn't ceased yet. It's it's kind of ongoing. We're right at the beginning of it. Um, but anyway, so with this extinction event, um, approximately eighty five percent of sea life was wiped out. Um, kind of breaking that percentage down, sixty percent of all marine invertebrate genera were wiped out, and then 25% of all families went extinct. So really, again, massive extinction event. Um, and it appears to have occurred in several phases. Uh, the, the first phase occurred prior to the end of the Ordovician period. Um, and that was due to a rapid cooling event. So at the, the start of this, during the lower to middle Ordovician, um, the Earth had a mild climate. Um, the weather was warm and the atmosphere contained a lot of moisture. Um, but what happened was, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, um, Gondwana was uh, 
throughout this period was moving southward um, and it eventually settled on the South Pole uh, during the later part of this period. Um, and when it did so, massive glaciers formed and covered the surface, which caused water temperatures to cool. Um, so mass glaciation event ensued. Um, now the second phase of the extinction occurred as sea levels fell because of the onset of glaciation um, over different portions of Gondwana. More specifically, it was over the African South American portions. So these massive glaciers formed and that caused shallow, sorry, shallow seas to drain and the sea levels to drop. So there was, uh, this had the greatest effect on these shallow water communities. Um, it drained uh, a lot of those uh, intertidal zones, um, but also just the drainage um, in, in sea area and drop in sea level, um, it ultimate, ultimately reduced the um, available habitats um, for the Ordovician organisms, um, particularly the, the organisms favoring these shallow communities. Um, so that, that's why these, um, again, these, these shallow loving uh, organisms uh, were greatly affected. Um, but deep water organisms were affected as well because you had a shift in oceanic chemistry, um, changes in the sal salination, desalination of the ocean would shift um, the uh, ocean currents and the, the thermal um, gradients in the ocean itself. Um, but uh, kind of what was selected for, per se, during this whole event were the, the cool water brachiopod fauna. Um, so they kind of invaded, um, during this, this interval of glaciation, they kind of invaded um, the, the tropical latitudes. Um, so they were able to persist, which is uh, why they, they held on through this period and into the uh, Silurian. Um, so that's the Ordovician, right? It was uh, characterized, again, in summary, by the diverse marine invertebrates. You see the um, evolution and appearance of um, the uh, jawless armored fish. Um, you have the first colonization event on land of, of plants and then massive extinction events. So now we move into the Silurian period. Um, this period occurred from 443.7 million years ago um, to about 416 million years ago. Um, this was the third period in the Paleozoic. So remember Paleozoic is, is comprised of six um, different periods. This is the third one. Um, so it followed the Ordovician and precedes Devonian. Um, during the Silurian period, um, you had a restabilization of the climate. So again, you had this glaciation event in uh, right at the end of the Ordovician. And then after that glaciation event, you had melting and restabilization of the climate. So the climate at the start of the Silurian period was generally warm and stable. Um, during this time, um, the continental land masses were, were relatively low and because of the, the melting with the, the glaciers, the sea levels were, were rising. So again, you had uh, flooding events on um, low-lying continental regions. And this meant that uh, again, rich, shallow sea ecosystems could form with um, new ecological niches and provide new environments um, for um, organisms to kind of occupy and differentiate into. Um, so, um, again, that, that's where you had these marine organisms going 
undergoing rapid differentiation, particularly because sunlight could penetrate through to the, the shallow water. So it was great for uh, plant life, a high amount of photos, photosynthetic activity. Um, so new life, per se, began to differentiate and colonize in these new and early estuaries, uh, freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems that were formed. Um, there's also extensive reef building uh, during this, this period um, because there was, as the, the water evaporated from um, low, uh, kind of low lying or shallow basins and oceans, um, there was deposition of rock salts and gypsum. Um, and that was kind of um, further catalyzed by the large barrier reefs. So as large barrier reefs continued to form from um, uh, the, the calcium carbonate skeletons of um, different uh, uh, dead organisms and uh, different uh, past corals, um, it kind of, res the, these reefs restricted uh, circulation um, and that again further propelled or catalyzed the evaporation of water which catalyzed um, deposition of rock salt and gypsum. So that was like another feedback that was going in. So that was the extensive uh, reef building that was that was occurring in the oceans. Now this um, period is known uh, primarily because it's uh, it introduced the first vascular terrestrial plants as well as the kind of the first arthropods. Um, in in this period, you had um, uh, some of the jawless fish survive, and they began developing thick armor plates. Um, so you had um, kind of the the first class of of jawless fish, um, uh, Agnatha, uh, become very dominant or or common throughout the period. Um, also, you had the evolution of the first jawed fish. Um, there were uh, a, a class of uh, marine arthropods um, that were very common uh, called uh, euptrids. Um, and you had other arthropod species. So you had, um, uh, again, both marine and terrestrial um, arthropods. You had the trilobites, you had sp spiders, millipedes, scorpions, um, and then a lot of these different plant species. And we'll get into each, each grouping specifically. So starting off with these nasty looking guys, um, these were the primitive armored fish um, with a and they actually had a cartilage skeleton, and they were the earliest fish to have developed jaws. These are the placoderms. Um, the first species of these placoderms, um, or class placodermi, was a species called uh, Romundina. Um, this species, it, it was a pretty large fish. Um, the head and thorax were covered by articulated armored plates. Um, and then the rest of the body had uh, no scales or very s small scales. So it's kind of like the, the front part of the fish was coated in this heavy armor. Um, now the placoderms, again, were some of the earliest fish that actually had jaws. Um, and these jaws likely evolved from uh, the first of the, their gill arches. Um, if you go back in my lecture history, you can actually learn about the evolution of uh, jaws from gill arches. Um, I think it's in the uh, second uh, part of the lecture series on the evidence of evolution. Um, 
<clears throat> but so these guys had the um, the early jaws, uh, likely again arising from their their first um, gill arches or the the mandibular gill arch. Um, now they had bony plates in their jaws. Um, they kind of served the function of teeth, but they weren't true teeth. Like these, these are not true teeth. They're, they're bony plates that serve the function kind of, of, of teeth. Um, but these guys did not descend from toothed ancestors. Um, these plates were, uh, again, took on the function of teeth, um, but they weren't true, true teeth uh, like the, the modern dentin uh, that we have. Uh, these plates were razor-like and actually self-sharpening, which is pretty crazy. So those were the, the jawfish. Um, they were a big predator um, of this kind of period. Um, another apex predator that arised in the Silurian Oceans were um, Eurypids. So these were marine arthropods. Um, they're actually likely most related or most closely related to modern day horseshoe crabs. Um, they had a semicircular anterior carapace um, followed by a, a jointed section and this long tapering tail. Um, now, most of these guys had two pairs of jointed walking legs. Um, follow, which are, are these right here, um, followed by um, a pair of kind of paddle-shaped swimming appendages, which are these here. Um, most of them had a, a spike on the end of the, their tails, which may have been used um, to inject venom into their prey. It's not quite known whether that was the function of it, but it gave rise to their common name, which is uh, sea scorpion. Um, now, these guys would persist into Devonian, and by the Devonian period, these animals actually became the largest known arthropods to have ever lived on Earth. So these are your little sea scorpions, your oceanic arthropods. Now, Again, this, this period, the Silurian period, had a warm, stable climate, and that provided for one of the most significant developments to take place, uh, which was the arrival of the first vascular plants to colonize the land. Um, again, lichens uh, and just uh, a lot of your er uh, early or primitive bryophytes were the first or photosynthetic organisms to actually colonize um, terrestrial regions, um, kind of like clinging to the, the rocky coast areas on, on these continents. Um, now when organic matter from, uh, decaying bryophytes, um, starts, uh, to build up, it, it forms true soil, um, as well as, um, the, erosion of rocks that that creates soil and that started to build up in these shallow estuary regions um, and once you had the buildup of of soil you had the evolution of these early bryophytes um, that had first appeared in the late Ordovician. Um, these bryophytes evolved rigid stems which enabled them to stand upright. Um, and they also began to develop and evolve tubular tissues um, that enabled the transport of water and nutrients. Um, this is something that's common to all vascular plants, um, hence their name. The stem of a vascular plant contains thin tubules that carry liquids within the plant. Um, and they're more they're better known as the xylem and phloem. Um, now these early vascular plants, they were kind of like these little leafless spikes. Um, they were only about the size of your index finger. 
um, the oldest known division of vascular plants during this period um, were the Ryan, uh, Rhinophyida. Um, the, uh, for these uh, plants, the shoot was leafless um, and it was uh, dichotomously branched. Um, now the first known plant to actually have the, the upright um, stalk and uh, vascular tissue for water transport, um, this was Coxonia. Um, this was a very little plant. It was only a few centimeters high. Um, had a branch structure with this kind of bulbous tip. Um, it lacked true leaves. Um, so it was, it's hypothesized that um, this was a, a spore producing plant. The, the stalk developed to disperse spores um, and itself was not photosynth photosynthetic. Um, now, as these first kind of colonizer, colonizers uh, moved more into terrestrial environments, it also encouraged some of these aquatic animals to make the transition to land. Um, the first known air-breathing animals to kind of uh, move terrestrially uh, were arthropods. These were millipedes, centipedes, and um, very primitive arachnids. Um, all of these first appear in the, the Silurian period. Um, and since arachnids are exclusively predatory, um, this represents the creation and evolution of the first terrestrial food web, uh, which is significant. So terrestrial evolution really starts taking hold at, um, during the, the Silurian period. So moving out of the Silurian into the, the next period, this is the fourth period of um, the Paleozoic um, era. Uh, this is the Devonian period. Um, the Devonian period occurred around 417 million years ago, uh, lasting until 354 million years ago. And there were significant changes in the world's geography uh, during this period. Um, at this time, the world's land um, predominantly was, was collected into two supercontinents. You had Gondwana and Euro-America. Um, so here's Gondwana, here's Euro-America. Um, these vast uh, land masses were situated relatively close to one another. Um, and they occupied really a single hemisphere. And then the rest of the globe was covered in this vast ocean. Um, now the two continents or the two supercontinents themselves. So here's again, here's Gondwana and here's Euro America. Um, they were kind of surrounded on all sides by subduction zones. Um, and with the subduction zones between those uh, supercontinents, um, this major uh, collision event per se was kind of set in motion. Um, and that event uh, would eventually bring the two supercontinents together, um, forming the single world continent, Pangaea. Um, and that would occur in the Permian. Um, so the, the important thing to remember at, at this time is that you are setting up for the creation of Pangaea. Um, again, that's going to actually happen in the, the Permian, but there are two different supercontinents existing at this time. You have Gondwana and Euro-America. Um, and through this period, there were, there were different uh, changes as far as global patterns um, and regional activities. Um, so you had different collision events, um, occurring between the, the small sections of these uh, supercontinents. Um, 
So, for example, in the, the Euro-America um, supercontinent, you had uh, the collision of what would become North America and Europe. Um, and that resulted in these massive granite intrusions um, and the raising of what would become the Appalachian Mountains of eastern North America. Um, so you had a lot of these collision events that started the formation of mountains. Um, you had uh, vigorous erosion of these newly like uplifted areas. Um, and you also had deposition in, in lowland and shallow seas. So a lot of uh, global changes as well as regional changes. All right, so we call this period the age of the fish um, because there were some really major developments um, in uh, the Devonian uh, sea organisms. Um, this included the appearance, appearance of um, many new types of jawed fish and even the evolution of sharks. Um, the jawed fish at this time had bony jaws. Um, much like those of present day fish. So uh, the, the placoderms, they had a jaw, but it wasn't a bony jaw, it was more of a cartilage based system. So this is when you see true bony jaws. Um, so some of the, the species kind of introducing you to some of the characters, um, the main ones that we're going to talk about are kind of these three here. Um, the Dunkleosteus, which is some more of the, the fish species, the Dunkleosteus, it's a, such a funny name for this terrifying looking creature. Um, the Dunkleosteus was a species of placoderm, um, which are, again, are the extinct armored fish, um, that lived during the Devonian. And they're best known for their armored heads and these really powerful jaws. Um, and again, their, their jaws were comprised of hard plates instead of teeth. Um, and again, uh, very similar to what I had talked about with the, the placoderms um, of the Silurian period. Um, but their jaws could exert intense crushing power. So they were kind of like the super predators of the Devonian seas, Leo Figaro. Um, now these guys were huge. They were at least 6.2 meters in length. And to give you an idea of just how large that is, humans on average are 1.8 meters. So they're about six times our size. Um, there's also Dipterius. Um, Dipterius means two wings. Um, this is an extinct genus of lungfish, uh, heard about 370 million years ago. Um, it was about 14 inches long, so pretty big. Ate mostly invertebrates, um, but the, the important thing about this, this guy is it had lungs, um, not an air bladder. So this is where you see the evolution of um, a lung system. Um, in fish, and therefore the, the creation of lungfish. Um, the most important event of this period was uh, the evolution of forelimbs and tetrapods, and uh, the transition from fish to early amphibians, um, which is what I'm going to really go into now. Um, so uh, this species, this is a Canthostega. Um, this was kind of one of the, the first early amphibians. Um, it was a com, or I, I should say, it had a combination of fish-like and tetrapod features. Um, so it it uh, was amphibious. Uh, sorry, not amphibious. It was aquatic. Um, and even though it possessed many fish-like characters, it did have legs and feet rather than fins. Um, so this was thought, again, to be a, an early tetrapod. 
kind of serve as a transitional species from fish to tetrapods or fish to amphibians. Um, but it was still an aquatic animal. Um, it could not walk on land. Um, it likely lived in shallow kind of plant choked swamps. Um, now, again, it was aquatic, right? So prior to finding the, the fossil remains of Acanthostega, um, most scientists assumed that the evolution of legs and feet uh, was initiated and driven by the colonization of land. Um, but Acanthostega challenges that, right? So here we have an early tetrapod um, that was extremely ill-suited for life on land. Um, it could not walk on land. It had um, well-defined digits. So it had well-defined fingers and toes. It had actually eight uh, phalanges um, on each uh, leg and, and foot, but it didn't have wrists or ankles. Um, it had relatively long limb bones, but they couldn't support much weight, um, particularly the, the hind limbs, um, because the, the hip was attached to the backbone. So its hip couldn't support much weight at all, um, since it had that weak attachment to the spine. These guys didn't have a, a, a pelvic bone, um, so it, it couldn't have a good locomotion or movement of the legs. And again, uh, the legs weren't strong enough to actually support the weight of the body to allow them to walk on land. Um, but they were very good at swimming. Um, their, their spine was structurally based on the ancestral notochord. Um, so it, it didn't really have, uh, or wasn't really based on a series of interlocking flexible vertebrae. Um, but that made the spine well suited for handling the mechanical stresses of swimming. Um, but again, it was because it wasn't uh, a, a strong, flexible vertebral column, it was more of this, this ancestral notochord, it was practically useless as far as supporting weight. Um, in addition, the, the acanthostega um, had very short, thin ribs. And those ribs were incapable of protecting vital organs um, if it tried to prop itself, figure out, if it tried to prop itself upright um, on land. Uh, the organs, uh, when an animal walks on four limbs, usually the ribs and the sternal, um, sternum kind of protect the um, mediastinal organs um, as they fall forward with the, the pull of gravity. In this species, such could not be supported because the ribs were so short and thin. Um, so it could not support internally, um, the, the organs couldn't handle uh, kind of a, a quadra head stance on land. So it could be supported in water, but if it tried to prop itself up on land with nothing kind of supporting underneath it, um, it you would have damage to the organs. There was no, nothing capable of protecting those organs. Um, it had a, a long tail, uh, this really neat little uh, kind of feathered filament um, arising from the, the uh, notochord region, uh, which served as this large bony fin. Um, so again, the, the tail was well suited for, for swimming. Um, and the limbs themselves, uh, you had the, the eight phalanges, um, but they were webbed, so they were better suited, even though they weren't fins, they were better suited for swimming. They were kind of paddle-like limbs. Um, so this uh, kind of even more indicate 
indicative of the aquatic lifestyle for Canthostega by Figaro um, was the presence of these internal fish-like gills. Um, so they had bony gill arches, um, and they had uh, post-brachial lamina, uh, which were situated on the, the leading edge of the shoulder girdle. Um, now this is in contrast to modern gill breathing amphibians, which have external gills. Oh my goodness, everybody suddenly wants to talk to me. I'm such a popular person, not really. Um, anyway, um, so those were your Acantha stegas. They were um, fish-like amphibians. Um, they had both fish-like characteristics, but also characteristics of tetrapod, but they were more fish-like in that they were definitely aquatic based. They were, they could not survive on land. Um, they also, um, so going on with the evidence of their, their aquatic lifestyle, um, they retained or possessed this, uh, the lateral line system for sensory organ organs, um, the same one found in fishes. Um, they also had small fish like nares, which are nostrils, um, that likely were used only for smelling underwater. Um, air could have been brought into the lungs by, by gulping rather than actually brought in through those nostrils. All right, so moving on to the next character, uh, this is Euthanopteron. Um, these are primitive lobed fin fishes. Um, they were approximately 1.5 to 1.8 meters or five to six feet long. Um, and it was an active carnivore. So this had, uh, the species had numerous small teeth and uh, it's very broad skull. Um, now this guy is important as far as um, possessing many of the traits uh, that indicate, again, the evolution of early tetrapods. Um, we'll also talk about in a moment how it was uh, kind of um, important in the evolution of um, pelvic bones. Um, the overall pattern of this of the bones in the skull, um, or cranial bones, again, they're very similar to that of early tetrapods. Um, but the vertebral column was not well developed um, in that there were uh, vertebrae, but the um, vertebral arches were not strongly fused. Um, and the arches didn't interlock um, as, as they do in tetrapods. Um, the shoulder was still attached to the skull um, at this point. So you still had a fused shoulder girdle, um, but the hip girdle um, down here uh, was not attached to the vertebral column, um, but it was at this point very rudimentary. Um, so the, the fleshy fins of these guys, um, almost, well, they are homologous to, uh, the, the tetrapod, uh, forelimbs. They had a series of stout bones supporting them. Um, and again, these were homologous to, uh, the, uh, forelimbs and the, the bone structures of, modern land vertebrates. So they had a humerus, radius, ulna, femur, tibia, and fibula. Um, but with these guys, the, the limbs ended in a series of, of bony rays, um, much like those of, of the fins and ray-finned fishes. 
um, that you see today. So Eusopteron was, again, important for the evolution of, of these kind of the, the four limb bone structures, um, but it was not built for life. Uh, instead, it, it seems to have lived in shallow waterways, uh, that's where a lot of its fossils have been found, um, and would have lived kind of in these brackish waters where it could have kind of clambered am among rocks and plants in search of food. Um, now it could, interestingly, it, it had two ways of obtaining oxygen. Um, it could obtain oxygen by breathing it from the air with its lungs, um, or by absorbing it from the water through its gills. So it had gill slits and it also had lungs. Uh, the most notable features of the Eusopteron um, were these powerfully built um, pectoral and pelvic fins and girdles. So this is the fossil of Eusopteron um, that's been found. Here are the pectoral fins and girdles, and then the pelvic fins and girdle occur at the, the hind end. Um, this led to early speculation uh, one time that Eusopteron could use these fins to, to crawl out of the water and onto land. Um, so as, as a result, it, it led to Eusopteron being classed um, by some as kind of a link to early tetrapods, um, which it, it does play a, a role in that, but it's not uh, really the, the, the major transitional fossil for, for such. Um, again, Eusopteron, uh, most likely in kind of the, the widely accepted view is that it stayed in water, um, but it did develop the parts that would allow for the evolution of legs. Um, and we'll see that uh, with the kind of the next transitional species um, that actually, uh, had a further evolution of primitive legs. Um, so this suggests that the evolution um, of primitive legs arose from creatures that were still primarily aquatic. And um, these kind of were early adaptations that would then progress as they were selected for, as they enabled different organisms to move out of the water and uh, uh, occupy different niches that, that were available. Um, some of the adaptations that kind of continued uh, were these primitive fingers and leg joints um, that enabled uh, kind of navigation, but also uh, would serve useful for locomotion. Um, so again, Eusopteron is important because it presented um, and contained some of the features that would later become uh, important and present in your terrestrial amphibians. Um, so as I, I spoke of before, the, the bones of the pectoral fins and um, pelvic fins. So they have um, similar uh, bone arrangements of modern day forelimbs. Um, they also had teeth, so the, the teeth displayed folded enamel like um, structures, and they had internal nostrils. So they're important again for because of their, their pelvic uh, fin and pectoral fin uh, bone structures um, and that role in the evolution of the forelimb structure for um, early tetrapods. Um, now, for a while, again, Eusopteron was thought to be that, that major transitional species. Um, it is not, it's, it's one of the, the, the links in, in this transition but the, the major uh, transitional species that, that's kind of quoted as the, the missing link um, 
is a, spe a species known as um, Pitalic. Um, this is the kind of this halfway between Eusopteron and Ichthyostega. Um, it shares many characteristics of a tetrapod and a fish. So it's often called a uh, fishopod. Um, it it's really looks like it's half fish, half tetrapod. It's almost like this fish-like alligator per se. Um, it had uh, a big fin on the posterior aspect um, and half of its body, had four legs um, and a, a flattened head resembling that of a reptile. So, you know, it looks almost like a little alligator here. Um, it also had gills, scales, um, and fins uh, like a fish. Um, but it had a robust rib bones and a neck structure um, like tetrapods. Uh, this is actually the, the first species to have um, a movable or free neck. So this guy was able to move its head back and forth, up and down, because it was not fused um, or uh, the bones were not uh, fused with the skull uh, connecting to the, the vertebral column. Um, the front fins of Tiktaalik uh, were half fin, half leg. Um, the, the fossils show a uh, functional uh, wrist. It was a, a rudimentary or elementary wrist structure. Um, they had elbows and shoulders, um, but they still had the kind of the, the, the ray structures of uh, fish fins. Um, but again, you see the evolution and the strengthening of the pectoral girdle and the forelimb morphology of uh, tetrapods. Um, so it's kind of, again, this movement from fins into legs but it was a, a kind of a conglomerate of, of both. Um, they had uh, lungs and gills, um, and their ribs were imbricated, um, which means that they were able to support the needs of the lung. Um, so these ribs could support um, internal organs and protect internal organs when held in a quadruped or held upright in a quadruped position. Um, so they uh, had, um, again, the si significant um, evolution and, and kind of innovation of pelvic support, uh, which was important for locomotion. Um, the discovery of the um, pelvic girdle and, and fin material, again, made uh, this species even, even more uh, kind of set in stone as a transitional species and, and actually reveals a, a transitional stage in the origin of the pelvic girdle and um, appendages. Um, so it, it retained aspects of the primitive skeletal ar architecture, um, but also showed beginnings in the enhancement of, of size and robusticity, um, much like that, which is seen in tetrapods. Um, the pelvises of the tiktaalik, um, they are paired. Um, and again, they have these broad iliac processes, uh, flat and elongate um, pubes, uh, the acetabulae um, that form um, a deep socket. They're, they're there and they're rimmed by robust lip of, of bone. Um, so all of these components make the pelvis um, 
very uh, it, it's enlarged, but it's also um, very similar to these features that you see in in tetrapods. Um, but it, it even with these advancements um, or adaptations in the actual pelvic girdle of Tetalic, um there are still primitive features that are retained. Um, these include a lack of both an attachment for the sacral rib um, and an ischium. Now, as I was talking about before, the, kind of the most uh, important and ex exciting thing about Tiktaalik is, is the fact that um, the fins are supported by a tetrapod bone structure. Um, they have kind of these morphed fin leg structures um, or appendages um, that contain the skeletal structure that's homologous of um, tetrapod forelimbs. Um, so they have wrists, shoulders, uh, elbows, they have the um, humerus, radius, um, ulna, all these these structures that um, share uh, the complex bone pattern pattern of the, of the limb. Um, and as I, I also said before, it was it was uh, the first tetrapod. Uh, with a, a free neck or a neck that can actually move freely on its own. Um, so that feature and the kind of the um, the jointed wrists, the lungs, gills, uh, that those all would allow this creature to to live in water, but also come up onto land and transverse on land or occupy land areas for short periods of time. So it, could, it, could, it didn't solely live on, on land. It could come out of the water for short periods of time onto land. So that was this first, again, this transition uh, from aquatic ecosystems to um, occupying terrestrial habitats. And so as I said before, the tiktaalik is the, the transitional fossil. It's the in-between. Um, kind of the transition between um, Eustopteron and another species called Ichthyostega. Um, Ichthyostega is a tetrapod which lived about 370 million years ago um, during the, the late aspect of the Devonian period. Um, this guy was approximately five feet long, weighed about 50 pounds. Um, it kind of looks like a cross between a fat iguana and an alligator. Um, it's uh, again, it thought to have been both uh, aquatic and then moving onto land for short periods of time. Um, so most likely, it lived off a diet of uh, kind of um, small land lizards when it it did occupy the um, land regions when it did come ashore. Um, so Ichthyostega um, had uh, a small dorsal fin along the margin of its of uh, its tail. It might be a better image here. Um, yeah, not reach, not really. But it so it had this this small dorsal fin, um, and the tail itself possessed a series of bony features. Um, and, and bony supports, uh, which are kind of typical of the, the tail supports uh, found in, in fish. Um, so that was kind of a, a trait that was retained from earlier aquatic vertebrates. Um, some other traits that were tr retained from, from their uh, aquatic predecessors, per se, um, included this relatively uh, short uh, snout region 
Um, they had the presence of a pre um, opercular bone, which was in the cheek region, kind of right about here. Um, they also had a large um, hyoid. Um, so both the um, pre and the large hyoid, um, those both suggest that gills were still present. So this, um, this species retained um, the kind of the gill covers from fish and also had many small scales that kind of covered the entire body region. Um, now, so those were kind of retained um, traits. Um, some of the advanced traits that are, are shared with um, tetrapods included um, these uh, series of robust bones, which supported um, the leg structures. Um, they uh, had strong ribs, so again, that, that supported uh, and protected the organs, particularly those in the, the thoracic uh, region. Um, when it was held on land in a uh, quadrupedal stance. Um, so again, these uh, kind of act um, as an advancement of what you see moving from Eusopteron to Tiktaalik, um, and then finally these guys, your Ichthyostegas. Um, one of the, the coolest facts about Ichthyostega um, is that it had the ability to breathe air, at least for short periods of time. Um, even with this ability, it, it likely didn't spend a whole lot of time on land. Um, majority of its time, about probably 70 to 90% of its time was, was spent in the water. Um, and that's because it, even with the um, strong pelvic bones, um, pelvic girdle, limb structures, uh, robust bones, it had a very heavy body. Um, and at this point in time, the legs just weren't or likely weren't strong enough to carry its uh, uh, stout body around. Um, it could have some locomotion, but not for extended periods of time. Um, it was at the, the thoracic region uh, could support um, kind of uh, land-based time. Um, so as, as I said, it, it couldn't ex spend extended periods of time moving or transversing on land because the limbs just weren't strong enough. <clears throat> but again, it, it could persist on land. Um, one, it could breathe air. And two, the lungs were surrounded by um, a very robust rib cage. More specifically, uh, the rib cage was composed of overlapping ribs. Um, so that allowed this guy to spend time on land without suffocating under its own weight. Um, the spine was also much stronger in structure, uh, with the vertebrae being better developed um, and also um, developed in a way to articulate with one another. Um, so that's kind of the, the anatomy of ichthyostega. Um, it's possible that this guy uh, served as the base for rudimentary quadrupedal movement. Um, it's kind of debatable. I like to say that ichthyostega movement was kind of the earliest form of modern day abdominal crunches. Um, when uh, the skeleton of this species was examined and reconstructed um, back in 2005, um, it was found that the, the overlapping ribs uh, would have significantly restrained 
the kind of side to side walk expected for kind of the salamander like animal. Um, so in, instead, as a result, Ichthyostega likely had this weird kind of shuffle um, in which the legs um, moved, but the, the creature's torso was, was kept rigid um, or it used kind of an inchworm kind of crunch. So that's why I say it's the earliest form of abdominal crunches. You can see here both legs, uh, sets of legs, so the, the forelimbs and the hind legs come together. So you get this kind of inchworm-like kind of crunch and then they separate out. Um, so simply simply put, uh, your stegas, as far as moving on land, would have been pretty crappy and pretty pretty much rubbish on land. Um, so it it could have um, served a role in the 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 uh, as far as adapting or playing a role in the evolution that would then adapt the tetrabod uh, body plan. Um, it, uh, it's possible that it served for rudimentary quadrupedal movement. Um, it's hard to say because again, the structure of the, the ribs would have prevented um, the side to side kind of walk um, that you expect from from these creatures. Um, but they it's possible that they could kind of um, scrunch up its its body um, and have a slight range of motion of the legs that it could kind of swing the legs from side to side. Uh, but that that range of motion would have been very restricted. So likely it was more of this inchworm like kind of motion rather than the um, the quadrupedal shuffle per se. Um, so during the Devonian period, those are kind of the what was going on with the the animal species. He also had development of the uh, floral species of occupying the um, terrestrial regions. Um, so these, some of the, the, the first, uh, land flora, uh, were these, um, uh, tyrids, um, and with this, you see the development, um, of a species called Rhiney. Um, these, uh, were, again, some of the, the, the first, land flora um and more specifically the the rhiny shirt it's actually has exact morphological matches to living species um so these were the kind of the the plants that were developing at the, at this time um you also um had the arisal of fungal species um more prominent were these um, prototaxites, uh, which were these huge, kind of thin dome like plants that were about 26 feet tall. Um, so, again, Devonian. The end of it was marked by an extinction event. Um, the extinction in late Devonian occurred about 375 to 370 million years ago, or three, 360 million years ago, sorry. Um, this uh, was caused by widespread anoxia in ocean waters um, and global cooling. Um, and in this at this extinction event, 50% of all uh, genre went extinct, uh, with the most effect being placed on marine organisms. Um, so it's uh, kind of evidence for this anoxic or oxygen deprived event um, is the fact that 
the Devonian marine deposits um, are notable for the occurrence of um, uh, organic rich sediments uh, called black shale. Um, and that high presence in these, these low inland sea areas um, again indicate anoxic bottom waters um, during that uh, time of the, the extinction event. Um, it's likely that these deposits uh, resulted um, because of increased organic matter and nutrient ports um, from the increased vegetation on uh, terrestrial landscapes. So as those uh, terrestrial vegetative species die, that vegetation runs off and builds up in these shallow water regions. Um, and as they decay, it causes anoxia um, or again, the oxygen deprivation because you have the buildup of different bacteria and algal species um, that kind of create a, a eutrophic um, shallow water environment. Um, so that that's what's thought to have really catalyzed this um, extinction event. Now, following the Devonian period um, was the Carboniferous period uh, from 359 to 299 million years ago. Um, now, this period is often divided by geologists into two separate subperiods, uh, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods. Um, the Mississippian subperiod is slightly longer, um, but the, the majority of uh, landscape formation per se occurred um, or formed during the Pennsylvanian. Um, now, during this period, you had the formation of these vast swamps in the, the wet regions um, that were called coal forest swamps. Um, the amphibians and in insects that previously had evolved occupied these forests um, and actually catalyzed the creation of, of coal forest swamps. Um, when uh, plants and animals um, in, in the swamp die, their remains build up in thick layers. And over millions of years, pressure and heat change these layers of sediments into deposits of coal. Um, so many coal beds uh, were created during this period, and that's actually where the name is derived. Um, the Carboniferous period takes its name from uh, the, the coal deposits. Carbo means coal. Um, so you have beds of, of coal that really form the majority of the, the strata from this layer, or, sorry, strata from this period, um, as well as sandstone, shale, and limestone. Um, so during this period, uh, you had uh, huge growth of these, of these swamps, um, and they were essentially equivalent to um, uh, kind of like modern rainforests. Um, climatically, there was a trend towards milder temperatures during this period, um, which was actually evidenced by the increase in the number of tree and fern species. Um, really large fern species that occupied this time, um, but also a decrease in the um, size of certain insects. Um, 
also during this time, there was a high concentration of oxygen um, in the, the moist environments, and that allowed for larger um, invertebrates um, on land. Um, again, there was a, a size constraint on that. Um, the uh, swamps that that uh, kind of occupied the, the terrestrial regions, again, were almost equivalent to rainforests. Um, there were these huge fern species. They were basically fern trees um, that, that covered the, the landscape. Um, and because of the amount of nutrients based in the atmosphere and the, and the soil, you could have uh, really exaggerated growth of both floral and faunal species. Um, now the, the Carboniferous period was a time when it's kind of the, the time of uh, many firsts. Um, so it's when the first of many animal groups evolved. You had the first true bony fish, uh, some of the first sharks, the first amphibians, and the first amniotes. Um, now that's kind of the greatest evolutionary innovation of this period. Um, the amniote or amniotic egg, um, because this allowed for the further exploitation of um, land environments by certain tetrapods. Um, it gave the ancestors of modern day birds, mammals, and reptiles the ability to lay their eggs on land without um, risk or fear of desiccation. Um, now there were some pretty interesting species um, as far as your, your land vertebrates, um, even invertebrates. Um, occupying this era. Um, again, a lot of the organisms, um, some of them were not large in size, some of your invertebrates were very large. Um, so you at this, this period you had amphibians and winged insects. They were very common, um, but you also had the evolution of the first reptiles from um, early amphibians. Um, and the reason why you had the evolution of reptiles um, was because they could occupy and inhabit drier areas um, where amphibians could not survive. So they were able to occupy an un unoccupied, um, an open or available niche. Um, now, our actual understanding of life um, for kind of what was going on with amphibians during this period um, is complicated by what's known as the Romer's Gap, which is this um, 15 million year stretch of time um, where virtually no vertebrate fossils have been found or yielded. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to know what actually happened during that uh, span of time. Um, but what we do know is that at the end of that gap, um, the very first tetrapods um, of the, that had been uh, present during the late Devonian period, um, they were going through um, uh, Kind of different adaptation um, events. So they had lost their, at that time, they had lost their internal gills um, and were on their kind of on the evolutionary path of becoming true amphibians. Um, by the late uh, kind of um, period of the, the, the Carboniferous period, um, you had. Uh, basically true amphibians, and they were um, well represented by different genres such as um, amphibious and 
um, uh, what's the name? Phlegthonia, I think that's the, the name of it. Um, and both of these genre, uh, again, like your, your modern amphibians, they needed to uh, lay their eggs in water, keep their skin moist, um, so they, they couldn't venture too far out onto to dry land. Um, so that's where, or kind of what's selected for the evolution of reptiles. Um, the most important trait that distinguishes reptiles from amphibians is their reproductive system. Um, the shelled eggs of reptiles are better able to withstand dry conditions. Um, so they don't have to be restricted to uh, kind of aquatic or moist environments um, because they don't uh, have to have the fear that their eggs are going to um, desiccate. Um, so the evolution of reptiles was spurred um, kind of by the cooling, dry climate um, that appeared during the, the later aspect of this period. Um, one of the earliest reptiles that have been identified um, called Hylumnus appeared about 315 million years ago. Um, and then that was followed by the giant um, Ophiocondon, which was about a few million years later. That guy was almost like 10 feet long. Um, so by the end of this period, you had kind of the, the evolution of the, the first reptiles. Um, they had migrated well into the, the interior aspects um, of the, the land areas. Um, and they would serve as the early pioneers um, that would then spawn into archosaurs, um, uh, pilcosaurs, uh, therapsids, um, all of those would become present in the, the following Permian period. Um, and then the, those archosaurs would then go on to spawn the first dinosaurs, um, basically a hundred million years later. Um, so those were your amphibians and reptiles. Um, as I said before, there were also uh, um, winged insects were also very common. Um, they had a high presence of invertebrates during this time, and some of them were huge. Um, the Earth's atmosphere contained an unusually high percentage of oxygen during the, the late Carboniferous period. Um, in fact, it, it peaked at an astounding 35%. So this surplus was especially beneficial to terrestrial invertebrates, um, which uh, breathe via diffusion of air through their exoskeletons rather than the aid of lungs or gills. Um, so it, it kind of turned into this heyday of giant uh, invertebrates, of, of, of some, some invertebrates. Some were were large in body size, other were, were small, kind of increased in body size as you went uh, later into the Carboniferous period as you had a, a decrease in, in temperature. Um, but to give you some examples, there was this, uh, there was a, a giant dragonfly um, called Megalneria. Um, and this had a, a wigs, wingspan of um, about two and a half feet. And there was a giant millipede um, called arth Arthropleuria, um, and that was known to attain lengths of like 10 feet. Um, so again, very big invertebrates at the, the late stages of this period. And here are some of the, the tetrapods. Now, like all periods before, um, this, uh, the Carboniferous period ended with a mass extinction event. It was, it's actually called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, um, which occurred 
around 305 million years ago. Um, this was spurred by a crash in CO2 levels. So you had uh, these, these massive rainforests, again, pulled so much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that you had a crash in CO2. It actually crashed to an ultimate low level. Um, and this caused uh, an extinction event um, where you had a, a, a large amount of different plant and animal species um, face extinction. Um, you had the, the collapse of the Carboniferous rainforest system. You also had increased um, arid conditions. Um, now, kind of through um, this extinction event, um, you, you did per se uh, kind of have the, the preservation of tetrapod diversity. Um, it, it was argued uh, in 2010 that um, kind of some of this environmental fragmentation that was associated with the rainforest collapse led to um, increased global diversity by isolating local communities um, and diversifying landscapes to open new niches. Um, and from that, you actually had this mass uh, kind of ecological and faunal turnover um, occur. And more specifically, that occurred at uh, what's kind of here in, in this example, the Moscovian uh, Kazimovian boundary um, in Indiana. Um, when we talk about turnover, turnover refers to the replacement of one organism or group of organisms um, by another. Again, that usually occurs after an extinction event. Um, so after this extinction event, you did see these turnover events um, with faunal species and with um, environments. So there was a faunal turnover, so that's the replacement of one taxonomic group of organisms by another. Um, there's also ecological turnover, uh, which is the replacement of a group of organisms adapted to one environment um, uh, by a, a different group of organisms that are adapted to a different environment. And you can kind of see that um, here. So here are the, um, the amphibians uh, kind of before this um, extinction event and then amphibians following it. Um, and you see that you, there are more niches that are, are occupied um, by the amphibians and also with the more particularly with the reptiles. So here's the reptiles before the event, and then your KG reptiles are, are after the extinction event. Um, so before then, they you only had small, small uh, piscivores. After the extinction event, you had all these different niches occupied. So you had reptiles that were um, the piscivores, meaning they ate fish, um, insectivores, you had browsers and predators. So they went from occupying only one niche with a total of two families to occupying eight niches with five families. All right, so this did, a, so tetrapod diversity did maintain through this event, um, and it's actually indicated that. Um, you this kind of um, extinction event allowed for faunal and ecological turnover that increased um, the diversity um, of different tetrapod species. So this again just maps out the the first in evolution, um, and then going into the the Permian period. Um, the climate was much warmer. Reptiles became kind of the, the dominant species. 
this was when you had the um, collision of um, Gondwana and Euro America to form the supercontinent Pangaea. Um, this is also when you see the arisal of uh, kind of more uh, hardwood tree species, so conifers, ginkgos, and um, uh, some of the more of the, the softwoods like your, your ferns also um, evolve. So I'll end there. Those are kind of the, the major um, aspects of um, the some of the different transitions that I wanted to go through. There is a lot more to to cover and to talk about um, with uh, can the the evolution of of life. Um, this is as I, I told my students. This is something for you guys to go through more on your own um to cover all of this would take uh, basically like an entire semester um but i hope that from this you have a better understanding of what happened during the early periods um of earth history and kind of how you had the transition um, from aquatic to land species, transition from fish to amphibians, from amphibians to reptiles. Um, the first mammals uh, would arise during the, the Cenozia. Um, that's what it's largely known for. Uh, before then you had um, all reptile based and then during the Jurassic you had the appearance of dinosaurs um, and that again occurred before the the Cenozoic um, trying to get there for you so this is the Cenozoic again this is where you see the arisal of mammals as well as the appearance of the first primates and then later on the first humans um, but what I, I really wanted to do was cover the first major transitions uh, in the, the early aspects um, of Earth history. I feel like those are often forgotten about or not talked about. We go right to um, kind of what occurred during the, the Triassic and um, more specifically what, what occurred during the Mesoic and Cenozoic. Eras. Um, so I hope that this answered some questions that you may have about the evolution of life. Um, there are some great resources out on the, the web as far as going through the, kind of the geologic timeline um, and uh, kind of helps broaden your understanding of, of what occurred during each era. Um, if you have any comments or questions, just post them in the comments section. Um, but I hope that this, again, cleared up any questions you may have and that you walk away with a better understanding or learning something that you didn't know before.